Imagine you're the king of France. Your palace might be the greatest in Europe, but out in the street of your capital, there is revolution. The populace are rising up, demanding reforms and change, the end of your absolute power. Your life might even be in danger. How is it that the great power you inherited has found itself in a state of bankruptcy, an internal collapse? How could you possibly begin to explain the events happening around you that seem to be destroying every certainty you've ever known in life? <laughs> Hello, and welcome to another very special episode of History's Most. I am Peter. And I'm Alex, and today's episode is a special and exciting one because we are joined by Gary from the French History Podcast because he knows a hell of a lot more than either of us do about what we're going to be discussing today, which is, Peter? Well, the causes of the French Revolution. We're really going to be going down the rabbit hole here, um, discussing a whole bunch of different topics about what caused the French Revolution, uh, the social changes that were going on in France at the time. And I'm excited. I'm excited to, to be educated. <laughs> yeah, because it's a revolution I think everyone is familiar with, you know, who knows about history, even on a surface mm -hmm. level. But I think we're going to have a few illusions shattered about our understanding of it today. And, you know, Gary's here to do exactly that. So thanks so much for joining us, Gary. Thank you. And I think today is particularly fortuitous because uh, on this day in 1792, La Marseillaise, which is the national anthem of France, was actually composed. Mm. So uh, what a day to be talking about this. Indeed. This is, it'd been written in the stars. Um, I'm sure the writers of the Marseillaise would be delighted to know that right this moment in, what is it, 200 and odd years time, somebody's talking about the revolution. So let's set the scene, paint a picture. First of all, um, Gary, the context, 18th century France, could you kind of set up the key points of the context here for this revolution sure although where do you even begin <laughs> um i think this is going to be a difficult question and it's been a difficult question for historians because there are the immediate causes of mm -hmm. the revolution itself and then there are the long-term causes if i were a better storyteller i'm sure that we could do it in reverse and do short-term <laughs> causes first and then move it back as historians have done but i will shut up set up a general picture sure so, so essentially france in the 17th century was the great power of europe it was the wealthiest country it was the most populous country aside from possibly Russia. It was very technologically advanced. It was this incredible country. Uh, French was the international language of diplomacy under Louis XIV and his successors. So it was a, a truly incredible country. It wasn't as successful in colonization, but at least in Europe proper, it was uh, the country. Now, in the 18th century, things started to change because on the one hand, you, there was the rise of Britain. It established powerful colonies with large populations. It grew economically. It went through several... I don't want to say revolutions, but it went through a lot of bureaucratic upheaval, which mm -hmm. made it far more efficient. And I don't want to spend too much time on Britain, but it's worth noting just because 
the British and French rivalry has really made those two countries' histories develop in tandem. And as Britain developed, France essentially was falling behind. Bureaucratically, it was not as efficient. Mm. Um, one of the things that Britain did was Britain got rid of old corruption under William Pitt. Old corruption, basically, people would inherit official positions in government, and then they would just let some incompetent lackey do all the work, and the, he would get a cut of the money. They got rid of that. Um, whereas in France, there was office selling, uh, famously. There was a lot of inefficiencies. Oh, well, one one major important thing, and this is a theme that has run through most histories of the French Revolution, is the difference between the credit system, which is incredibly important because essentially what happened in the glorious revolution in Britain was mm -hmm. the uh, William of Orange came over, William and Mary of Orange, which was very, uh, came over and took power and brought with them the Dutch credit system. And mm -hmm. not to go too much into the weeds, you know, we'll get to the killing soon enough. <laughs> but just to talk slightly about economics, this is very important because if you can only pay in cash, then obviously you're limited. But the Dutch had developed a system where if you responsibly and reliably pay the banks, then you can take out these huge loans. And what we see is that during the... Uh, Spanish War of Succession, during the Seven Years' War, Britain is spending massively. They're spending four times as much as France, but they can do that because they have established credit. I mean, the Bank of England has existed for 400 years now, and they have never defaulted on a single loan. Mm. So basically, everybody is willing to give money to the British because they know they'll get it paid back. Whereas the old style of doing things was the monarchs of Europe would essentially spend all the money that they could. And then when they ran out, they just declare bankruptcy to get rid of their uh, loans, which now Europe is going through this economic revolution and Britain is taking full advantage of it, thanks to the Netherlands. Um, I can't give the British credit for anything. so. Uh, and, and France is not. And so on the one hand, there is this economic change and um, which France is, is not catching up with as well. There is the question of colonization. Obviously, the British are really dominating in this area. France is really falling behind. Um, other long-term things is the idea of the Enlightenment. Here you have this great philosophical revolution, and, and there are these theories of the dispersion of powers with Montesquieu. There's natural liberties with John Locke, and all of these other ideas of how a free society is the best society, both politically but also uh, economically with Adam Smith uh, on the Wealth of Nations, which theorizes capitalism. And in Britain, Britain is hardly a democratic society at this time. Barely anyone can vote. But at least there's some sort of representation for at least the wealthy in Parliament, whereas in France, it's an absolutist monarchy. Mm -hmm. So France is arguably behind politically as well, and that filters down socially because people have these concepts of freedom and they don't feel as free in France. So socially, they feel behind economically in terms of the empire. During this period, France definitely feels as if it is falling behind uh, Britain. So to fast forward just a, a little bit, because those are the sort of long-term consequences, mm -hmm. but Essentially, right before the French Revolution actually breaks out, there were – let me think for a second. Okay. So, so basically, um, 
France was trying to modernize its economic system. They wanted to actually be able to access credit. And that is when famously there is the controversy over presenting the budget. Um, what essentially happens is they bring in a Swiss uh, financial advisor, uh, Jacques Nicar, who he comes out with a French budget and he, in order to reassure creditors across Europe, and the budget basically states that France has the ability to pay off its debts. And the way he does this is he has the regular budget, uh, which calculates France's finances, and he doesn't put on war, which he holds as an irregularity, and therefore it doesn't have to be put on because assuming that France is not always at war, hmm. which is not particularly a great <laughs> yeah. assumption because they, they war a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can, you can argue whether or not it was duplicitous. I mean, essentially, he was right in saying that France did have the capacity to pay off all of its debts if it was responsible. And this is something that lots of ministers were saying, but the question is how responsible are the Louis going to be? Uh, because essentially every king was named Louis for a very long mm. time. <laughs> but um, in any case, so so Jack Nicar releases this budget, and the people of France say, oh, he's, he's saved France, he's you know, shown us this great thing. But then due to political and court intrigue, he gets fired, gets replaced by someone else who releases a budget with the, the war spending and shows that, oh, France is actually in a horrible position. Uh, people panic. Uh, people in the streets demand uh, Jacques Nicar come back. And this leads to a bunch of political chaos, which is compounded with an environmental crisis because essentially there is a series of famines caused by a bad harvest. And then that really begins the first phase of the French Revolution, um, because essentially, uh, as things are falling apart, then uh, Louis the Sixteenth has to call the Estates General, which is this long, uh, unused instrument of government, in order to raise taxes. And essentially, those who come to the Estates General decide that they're going to take advantage of it and push through reform. And that's when the revolution actually kicks off. So that is sort of the basic uh, foundation kind of for the yeah. French Revolution. Yeah. But then w what actually caused it, that's, uh, I suppose, what we're going to talk yeah, about. And that's gonna... when things get complicated. Mm. That's what we're going to deep dive into. Uh, one thing that kind of struck me is that is this this long term explanation of how do we go from being or France being in the 17th century the great power in Europe um, to being in a in a crippled position by the 18th century? So one of the kind of reasons you signposted, I suppose, was this this idea of falling behind the times, if you like. I guess resting on their laurels a little bit in the sense that Britain, which had a very traumatic 17th century with civil war and glorious revolution, et cetera, out of that, they got a bureaucracy and a economic system, a credit system that actually advantaged them going into the 18th century. Whereas France, because they were so successful and fairly other than the wars of religion, I suppose, stable um over the comparative time period that meant they went into the 18th century i guess you're kind of saying victims of their own success they didn't need to reform because they were so successful already yeah i think that is a good way to put it it's kind of like how the shark hasn't evolved in millions of years because it hasn't needed mm. to but in the case of france it's not quite as threatening although maybe it might seem so <laughs> to the british but yeah, there, uh, and another thing to think about is that even though France was dominant, it was essentially depleting itself because France under Louis XIV 
was frequently fighting wars against pretty much the rest of Europe. And because France had an enormous population and because the France uh, and because the French were very, very good soldiers and very good at fighting, despite later uh, stereotypes, mm. uh, the French were able to essentially take on most of Europe and actually take more territory and expand. But it did come at a great cost. And even Louis the Fourteenth admitted at the end of his life that he warred too much. So, yeah, essentially, I think what this time period shows in the transition from the 17th to the 18th century is the decline of this medieval view of Europe to a more modern view. And it's something which the British via the Dutch were able to really take advantage of because mm -hmm. in the old way, uh, the medieval style, essentially the way that you expanded the economy was by invading because the economy itself, before the rise of the Industrial Revolution, essentially economies are very slow because they're all built on manpower and horsepower. You know, there's only so much that you can accomplish when literally – the ability to do anything is based on how much this starving peasant can move something from one place to another. But then once you have the development of even simple technologies like water mills, you have the development of these ships that can traverse the Atlantic and bring with them all these exotic goods. Essentially, there is this modernization of Europe as economies no longer grow at a snail's pace, but actually can shoot up. And what's more important during this period than just having lots of people, which France did, and having lots of land, which France did, was having infrastructure, having technology, and having uh, essentially access to more resources, all of which Britain had. They were investing more in their infrastructure. Uh, Parliament and the British nobility were developing canals and waterways throughout Britain. They were setting up colonies across the world, giving them access to all these different high-demand resources. So essentially, Britain, whether by accident or foresight, let's say accident, but either way, <laughs> Britain got on the – they essentially took the lead in this area. And in the case of France, France was number one undisputed lead in the medieval world. But this isn't the medieval world anymore. This this old world of invading new territories and defaulting on your debts, this is – falling apart so yeah i think that was a really big problem and that france was the very best at a game that was essentially going out of style hmm. interesting so what you're saying is that basically i think you've put it really nicely in the sense that there were top dogs at a game people weren't playing anymore if what, what modernization had happened in france um you know in terms of, let's say, had they now got a professional standing army? Had they, um, how, how, how seriously were they taking kind of colonization of the new world? What infrastructure was being built, if any? You know, were they trying to catch up? So they actually were. Essentially, how do I put this? So... The French were not stupid, despite possibly terrible decision-making. Um, essentially, the French were trying to make canals, uh, particularly canals that connected the Atlantic to the Mediterranean. They were engaging in colonization, and of course, one particular colony they had, Haiti, uh, at the time called Saint-Domingue, was, I believe, the most profit creating colony of any colony in the world at the time because wow. sugar was so uh, in demand. Mm. 
So they were trying to modernize, but the problem is, is that when you look at this assist, uh, look at this system, it's kind of like looking at Russia during World War One, in that here is this massive country that is very spread apart. It's mostly rural peasants, and so trying to modernize it, it takes time. And yeah. essentially, if you compare France to Britain, I know nowadays we don't think of France as this huge country, but compared to uh, Britain, which was really, at the time, it was mostly England because Scotland was far more rural and same thing with Wales and mm -hmm. Ireland. So when we talk about Britain and its sort of development, we're mostly talking about uh, England during the at least first phase of the revolution. And England has all of these different rivers which allow for easy canal development. So relatively speaking, France was this very big and unwieldy country. And the problem that I think France often came up against was essentially what it considered to be its obligations made it very difficult to change. So, for example, when it came to the development of credit, and this is uh, one of the newer theories and a theory that I'm particularly fond of, of what caused the revolution, is that what caused the revolution might have been. France's attempt to modernize because essentially France had this old style of just defaulting on its debts, but the French ministers realized that, well, we can't just do this forever in order to compete with Britain, which is able to go into, you know, 200% debt in order to fight us. And meanwhile, we can't go into any debt. Essentially, what they decided was, okay, we have to develop lines of credit. We can't default. And Louis XVI essentially said, okay, we, you know, we're not going to default on our debt anymore. But the problem was is that even as France was deciding not to default on its debt, it was still fighting all these wars, and that meant that its debt kept growing. Mm. And so now you have this situation where they essentially – can't default on the debt because it's so huge you know it's it's almost instead of too big to fail it's like so big that it's guaranteed to mm. fail so so just like in some societies and and look i'm not an expert on the russian revolution although i do listen to mike duncan's podcast so that's uh, yes. close enough <laughs> but uh but essentially these are not these societies that are perpetually backward. These are societies that are trying to modernize. And one of the problems is that when you modernize sloppily or when you try to, as is so often the case, when those in power try to modernize based on Western democracies, in in the case of Russia, it would be just the West in general, France and uh and Britain, but in the case of France during this period, they're really looking towards Britain. They wanted to modernize in order to have efficient mechanisms of government, but they didn't want to grant more liberties to their actual people. Mm -hmm. uh, Louis the Sixteenth wanted a more efficient bureaucracy, but he didn't actually want his bureaucrats to be able to make decisions a la Parliament and uh, Britain. And so one possible problem to come out of this was that this was a sort of half measure or sloppily uh, developed modernization. And that really caused things to go out of whack in order to use a uh, professional historical job. <laughs> well, I was going to say to um, to kind of foreshadow a pun or hint towards a pun Louis basically wanted to have his cake and eat it. He basically oh, said, oh, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. It's better than uh, my jokes today. <laughs> Sorry. Um, there's a bit of a, a running theme, I think, with some of the things that you're saying, whether it be modernization or war, is that, and the whole credit issue is that everything they want to do costs money. Yeah. And it's money life. is the main <laughs> problem. I mean, um, 
one of the things I say when I'm teaching um, Henry VIII, you know, he wanted to carry out war after war and the problem was money. And I, I kind of, I mean, doesn't this make me sound like a great teacher? Um, you wish you had me because I say things like, what is war good for? Emptying your treasury. Um, because it's pretty much, I think probably even to this day, perhaps one of the most expensive things a state can engage oh, yeah. in, right? Um, so France was piling up the wars in the 18th century. Am I right? They were trying to do a lot of war fighting. Uh, yeah, I mean, arguably the First World War occurred during this period, the uh, Seven Years' War. But even before the Seven Years' War, there was the War of Spanish Succession, which didn't just take place in Spain or even Europe, but took place across the colonies. But then the Seven Years' War was really one of the most widespread, probably the most widespread war in history up to that point because there was fighting famously in North America where essentially in our textbooks we call it the French and Indian yeah. War because that's what America was fighting and essentially Britain had under their brilliant leader William Pitt he, they had a view of war as being this global affair. And so they were fighting vociferously in India, across Africa, in the Caribbean. And because of that, they managed to take all of these colonies from France. And between between William Pitt's brilliant management of the war and then Frederick uh, the Great of Prussia, pulling off uh, quite a few, I mean, maybe a dozen miracles or so, because he was the, the probably the greatest European general until Napoleon, that they really came out ahead because of it. So during this period, there were quite a few great wars. And then maybe this will be a good segue, but one of the most expensive wars being France's decision to join the American Revolution, which mm. was which was a, a fairly major war in the colonies, uh, in the American colonies themselves, but it wasn't limited to that. In fact, there was an incredible amount of fighting in the Caribbean. There was fighting over provinces in India, uh, again, all across the world, and ended up being much more expensive than I think the French anticipated. And also, it wasn't even that bad for the British, because even though the British lost the American colonies, they actually took quite a few colonies elsewhere, including col uh, very rich colonies in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So the American Revolution, and I think a lot of Americans think that it was this great, horrendous defeat of the British because they lost the greatest country that God ever created <laughs> in the history of the world. But actually, the British, relatively speaking, they didn't come out too bad. Um, it really, it was, it was the America's allies, which kind of took a beating, France and Spain. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it kind of backfired there. And then, of course, not only did it backfire in the immediate future, but in the long term, it was very expensive. And uh, leading into just prior to the revolutionary events, one event which a lot of historians have sort of looked over, but which has gained popularity among the structuralists is the essentially events that were occurring in the Netherlands, because uh, shortly before the French Revolution, there was a, I believe it was a civil war. I apologize. I'm not an expert on Dutch history, but there was some sort of civil strife between the Orangists and some other faction. And the British and the Prussians supported the uh, Orangists, and they expected the French to support the opposite side because didn't they always? But as it turned out, the French ministers said, 
we just fought this unbelievably expensive war just to piss off the British and it backfired. You know, we can't just keep doing this forever. And so the French didn't do anything. And that absolutely shocked uh, the powers of Europe because here this great power wasn't even getting involved in a dispute that was happening right across, uh, you know, right across the river, right across its borders. Mm -hmm. And it really showed a lot of these powers that, well, uh, France might just be a paper tiger. And so that not only did it um, embolden France's enemies, but at the same time, it led to far more widespread criticism of the French regime within France because they essentially realized that, you know, France used to be this great power that dominated Europe. And now, it can't even handle, you know, minor border disputes across its uh, most immediate, uh, most immediate territories right next mm. to it. Yeah, fighting that many wars and making all those attempts to modernize kind of put puts you on the fast track to like bankruptcy. You know, you are going to exhaust your treasury really quickly. Yeah, absolutely. So can we, um, before we go any further, are you saying then the American Revolution, despite the fact, obviously, it, it was a victory in the sense for France in the side they were supporting won, did France, was it just a net loss? They gained nothing at all from it? Um, was it just a drain? Um, I don't even know if you could call it a victory because, I mean, it was a victory for the American elites who managed to take control of this new country. But what did France gain? I mean, France lost colonies, France, um, not only that, but after the American revolution, the uh, Americans, most of their business was with the British. And also, even though they essentially wanted more rights and fought at war with the British, most Americans viewed themselves as being similar people to the British. Mm -hmm. And so obviously there was a split in politics with John Adams being pro-British and then Thomas Jefferson being pro-French. But even very quickly after the war, trade and economic ties resumed between Britain and the colonies. So France really lost out there. And then one thing that's going to happen is America racked up a fair number of debts with the British – or sorry, with the, the, with the French because uh, essentially America had to pay for a lot of yeah. military arms and support. But then what's going to happen is during the French Revolution – the Americans are going to say, well, we made these treaties with the Ancien Regime. We did not make these uh, – we did not take out loans with the French Revolutionary <laughs> Government. Therefore, we don't have to pay anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm not sure that France really gained much of anything. I mean they mildly pissed off the British because they – the British lost their largest settler colony. But – you know, you can't found a government just based on annoying the British. You know, we've, we've tried. <laughs> we've tried. Scotland's tried, but it hasn't been that successful. OK, so I think we've kind of set the picture then of those long term causes of a story of real decline over really a hundred year period, almost of falling behind, of becoming increasingly financially strained of fighting lots of wars and actually not gaining anything from them to the point where France, the great power of Europe, as you said, quite a startling example, wasn't even able to get involved in a kind of civil war in Holland. So if that's the kind of big picture, let's zoom in. What are the short-term causes? What are the trigger events that lead to the French Revolution? Right. So short-term events, well... One thing which we haven't touched on because it's kind of hard to insert, but it is very interesting. Have either of you read Robert Darton's um, 
the literary underground in the French, some, I think it's the French uh, ancien regime. No, I have not. Okay. I can't that, say that I have. No. Well, that's fine. Well, basically, it's uh, if you're ever going to do anything with the French Revolution, you have to read mm. it. Basically, this book, it really shows the other side of the Enlightenment, because on the one hand, when we think of the Enlightenment, we think of all of these very highfalutin, brilliant figures like Montesquieu, Rousseau, uh, Voltaire, all of these mm. great uh brilliant writers and thinkers but there's actually another side to it which robert darton found he found this massive amount of writing by the philosophers who essentially couldn't make it and here were people who either they weren't quite as brilliant or they just couldn't appeal to people but the thing is is that even though they're well i shouldn't say that i shouldn't say they couldn't appeal to people because actually some of them were more popular than Voltaire or Rousseau it's, it's just, just more the, they kind of haven't been remembered we don't right read exactly them today. there there were there were a lot of writers at the time who their work in retrospect was not that great and so it didn't become literary classics or they didn't spread outside of France but there were a lot of writers who essentially were very angry were very pissed off because they weren't respected or they didn't make money and so they wrote tract after tract that was lambasting the ancien regime because here were these people who they had dreamed of getting in these salons and being part of high culture and being accepted into the intellectual elite and they didn't they failed um, like me, but essentially they didn't have podcasting to do at the time. So <laughs> they had uh, nothing better to do than to write these tracks. And very often these tracks had very little philosophy or political theory, and they were mostly just personal attacks and slanderous accusations against the uh, leaders. They uh, slandered Louis the Sixteenth. They especially slandered Marie Antoinette as this foreign harlot who was uh, destroying France from within mm. and was depleting the treasury to buy jewels. That was actually a huge scandal. Uh, there was a diamond necklace or something. I don't know. I, I probably should know about Marie Antoinette, but as a labor historian, I really don't care much about the elites. <laughs> but in any case, so so there was, in addition to the Enlightenment, which criticized these governments because they viewed them as being totalitarian and not being in accordance with the natural development of the human spirit. There were all these other writers who could in fact become quite popular who with the lower classes that were saying that all of our leaders are a bunch of hyper corrupt uh, licentious losers. And so that really helped to desacralize the mm. ancien regime one thing that i think we need to think about when we go through all this is it's not just the structures of government that were under assault in france during the 18th century it was the belief in government and the prestige that it had because one thing that happened in britain is that not everybody agreed with what the British leaders were doing, but there was this assumption that the British leaders had some competency and some ability for leadership because they kept winning war after war. You know, they arguably won the War of Spanish Succession. They won the Seven Years' War. In the case of the American Revolution, that did cause quite a shock to the system. But on the other hand, they did gain some colonies. So even though a lot of people on the streets of London, particularly poor people, they didn't like their politicians, but they at least had some measure of respect. But in the 18th century with Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette and all of these uh, bureaucrats, many of which bought their positions, there, there wasn't respect for them because they kept losing all these wars. They were perpetually in debt. And so they viewed them as being these incompetent drains on society. So, so there was the 
constant publication of attacks against them, that I think was uh, a more immediate cause. Another thing, uh, immediate causes, so obviously there was the, the problem with uh, Jacques Nicar, where Jacques Nicar yeah. came up with a budget that said that France could pay off its debts, but then due to political intrigue, he fell, which um, I think ties into what was happening on Grub Street. That's what Robert Darton called it, um, where all these publications were made. This uh, That essentially, the fact that you had this brilliant person who could come up with a budget, and yet for political reasons, they had to remove him and replace him with some incompetent person, that really showed the people of France, that our politicians are corrupt. So there was that that was an immediate effect. There was the uh, ecological disaster that resulted in famine. It was, I think, one of the, I should probably know this, but I think it was it was an exceptionally hot year, which was why a lot of crops got ruined. And so uh, that resulted in a lot of chaos, a lot of people started spreading these rumors that the rich were hoarding grain, which actually wasn't true. In fact, it was quite the opposite in that governments were buying out grain from small producers and then collecting them for famine times in order to, in warehouses, in order to distribute them so that people wouldn't starve. But the rumor was that they were buying them out to hoard them in warehouses so that the rich would always have something to eat rather than the mm. poor. So that was literally the opposite, but you know, <laughs> public perception is better than reality mm. or more important. So, so yeah, that was an immediate cause. Then Louis the 16th calls the Estates general and he wants them to essentially give him a blank check to do what he wants. But when he convenes them, there's the first estate, which is the no, uh, which is the clergy, the second estate, the nobility, and then the third estate is everyone else. And all of these enlightenment thinkers, uh, all of these lawyers and bureaucrats, because essentially during this period, France now has a, a not particularly sizable compared to its entire population, but it has a, well, I mean, Okay, it, some ninety percent of French people were very poor, but the point is, is that it, it had a a growing bourgeoisie, mm -hmm. and so these bourgeoisie basically say, well, since we since uh, uh, Louis depends on us to get more money, we can use this as leverage to address our grievances, and that's when they present uh, the famous Kaye uh, listing all of their grievances and. Uh, Essentially, when when talks break down, there the when the third estate isn't allowed in one of the meetings, that's when they reconvene on a tennis court and they take the tennis court oath. That's when they declare that the third estate is the one that holds sovereignty. And so, again, that was one of the major short-term causes of the revolution was the the breakdown in talks between the bourgeoisie and then the other uh, estates. I want to. Um, I'm fascinated by the the idea that this is, I guess, brought about or is only possible because of maybe it's too far to say an age of mass literacy, but certainly the fact that literacy is now a large proportion of the population are able to read and write, so that criticism of the elites and of the of the monarchy starts to kind of spread and it is disseminated and like you say it kind of desanctifies takes away the illusion of prestige and competence that the ancien regime had so what one thing that's, that's fascinating to me is it's an autocratic regime very much a top-down you know power is concentrated pretty much in the hands of the king and the people he decides to share it with um, did the king and the regime try, like, say, a modern autocratic regime would, of clamping down on this free speech, this wave of criticism? Or did they just not see that it would have any kind of consequences for them? Well, a couple things to 
a couple things to pick on for what you said. I shouldn't say pick on because I agree with what you said, but to to clarify. Yeah. So when you say mass literacy, um, I, I think it's fair to say that it's just we have to broaden the idea of what literacy is because mm -hmm. most people at the time couldn't read, but quite a few people knew someone who could. So oh, right. there would be someone who could read what news was happening, and then through them – they would get their news. So maybe not mass literacy, but mass information, sure. Or, yeah. you know, the development of mass media. Um, again, that's maybe a touchy term, but either way, yeah, the, the mass dissemination of information. As per whether or not the French regime cracked down on people, I mean, yeah, I, I think this is uh, maybe again fortuitous because I'm dealing in my dissertation mm -hmm. with the development of mass government surveillance in World War One, and I, I tried to do this Braudelian, giant, brilliant uh, series where I looked at the. Uh, and before anyone thinks I'm being pretentious, just know that it, this kind of fell on its face. <laughs> but I tried to look at um, I tried to look at the development of governmental surveillance from the Norman invasion of England all the way to uh, World War One, which is the point mm -hmm. of my dissertation. And what's interesting, even if not all my theories were accepted by my dissertation committee, is that France really had one of the best systems of control and surveillance, arguably the best in all of Europe, maybe in the world. Um, the Paris police had frequent political police. They had spies that would infiltrate uh, groups that they thought were seditious. There was the famous uh, uh, Lettre du Cachet, where literally the the monarch could just write a letter and send it out, and then uh, a person would just disappear. They'd be picked up by the police. Um, I think most of us are at least kind of familiar with the story, The Man in the Iron Mask mm. and the uh, uh, the Bastille and how you could uh, – or, or no, even not just the Bastille, but one of my favorite books of all time, The Count of Monte Cristo, where – they got sent to the Chateau d'If, which is the island prison just off Marseille. And any, essentially anyone who criticized the French monarch particularly could just be gone, removed from society. And so they did have quite an incredible ability to silence dissent at the time. The problem, though, and one of the main arguments that I make in my dissertation is, um, which that is a strange plug since nobody's going to buy a dissertation. <laughs> but um, one of the main arguments that I make is the development of surveillance, it essentially goes from different groups in different ages. And in the medieval period, the main point of surveillance that medieval governments were focused on was on their fellow aristocrats. Because if you think about it, the aristocrats were the only ones who were capable of actually threatening the central government mm -hmm. and the yeah. monarch. Because essentially, essentially, in medieval society, all medieval society, except for the super rich, is local. I mean, before the development of of advanced roads and, and railroads and that sort of thing, 95% of people lived and died within 10 miles of where they were mm -hmm. born. And so essentially, you know, there could be peasant rebellions, but they were never revolutions, at least that, that historians don't call them that. Um, they were always rebellions because they were always local, whereas aristocrats, you know, King Henry the VIII, when he was dealing with uh, the People's Crusade, you know, King Henry VIII could draw upon knights from all across his realm. And meanwhile, at most, the peasants might rally up a couple towns. So most of their surveillance was focused on aristocrats or the wealthy. And so one thing that caught the French off guard during the early days of the revolution was they didn't realize the power of 
the middle class, and they also didn't realize how widespread opposition to the regime was. Because essentially, this was a period where because roads were so much better, because there was such better transportation, both in the form of of boats and in just better infrastructure in general, canals, this was a period where essentially localism was beginning to decline and the idea of a united nation uh, where people could actually um, interact across many, many miles was beginning to take place. And so here, the the French elite, they, they did have a very a powerful system, again, arguably the best uh, uh, anti-subversive surveillance system in the world, but it was focused on aristocrats and it was focused on these small elites uh, at the court of Versailles. It was not focused on these masses of the middle class, or, or, and especially not on the peasants at all, uh, who actually were finally in a position of power to overthrow them. Hmm. I'm fascinated by this kind of precocious, well, it seems very precocious to me, repressive apparatus Um that, you know, I mean, I think about law enforcement in, you know, Britain didn't have a police force until the 19th century. You think about law enforcement in the United States in the 19th century, very kind of haphazard, particularly. Wild West. Um, the further west yep. you go. Um, and yet King Louis had a police force and a kind of surveillance system, but it was only deployed against his own, well, against the the second estate, against the nobility, right? So... Would there even be a scope to have used that against the wider kind of bourgeoisie or third estate, or or would it probably not have been up to that task? Um, so a few things to clarify. So you're right. Um, the actual – so where we get our term police, yeah, that comes mm. from 19th century Britain. But even though Sorry, there weren't yeah. – no, 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 you were right. I'm correcting myself. Um, or – I'm doing this thing that historians do to save face, which is I'm not saying I'm wrong. I'm just <laughs> trying to expand the term, which is it's it's funny because there is this they, they use the word policing and the word policing goes back farther than the actual police forces. So when I say that the right. that, that Paris had police, I mean, they basically did have a, a governmental force that kept people in line, but we wouldn't call them police, you know, right, just okay. for the just for like the one or two historians out there who want to call me out on this. But um, in any case, yeah. So, so to answer your question, um, yeah, I think the, the revolution caught them off guard because not to be too much of a, a Marxist, because I think the Marxists have overblown the power of the bourgeoisie. But the fact is, is that there was this rising middle class that, the the French government was not paying attention to. And the thing is, is that I really think that so often when people think about politics, they think about individual names. They think about essentially bureaucratic division uh, they essentially think of you know when i when i ask if i ask someone you know what is american politics they might say you know the president congress that sort of thing and all those are important but i think people severely estimate uh, underestimate the actual structures of government and so if you look at uh, france at the time yes uh, fear, uh, King Louis was in charge. Okay, King Louis, his ministers, they were at Versailles. Great, whatever. But if you look a little bit beneath the surface, what you'll find is that the bourgeoisie were already in incredible positions of power because at this time, what was taking place was a lot of nobility were suffering, a lot of nobility were losing their wealth and some of them were even getting rid of their titles because their titles um, came with expenses depending on which title you had 
And so there was actually some people who were uh, denobilizing, if I could invent a term that no one will use. But whereas um, here's the, uh, this was the uh, noblesse de l'épée, which is uh, nobles of the sword. Those are the old nobles. But then there's uh, noblesse de robe, which were the new nobles who essentially bought their positions. And so what was taking place was as the sword nobles were in decline and were either the sword nobles were either becoming less important as they uh, the poorer ones essentially got rid of their titles or what they would do is they would hire some intelligent middle class bureaucrat to run their position and so because of this process, and by the way, this ties into the decline in France's financial fortunes, because the poorer France gets, the more it decides to sell off offices, and which actually kind of has a uh, problematic effect, because uh, the poor, it, uh, as it runs into financial trouble, it sells off more offices, which the uh, bureaucrats, uh, which these middle class bureaucrats buy into, and because they want to have positions and titles and um, further their careers. And so they buy into the bureaucracy. And then what happens is France ends up with a large bureaucracy. And so, oh crap, you know, we can't afford this. What are we going to do? Well, let's sell more offices. And so they sell <laughs> more offices. And the result is that France has this enormous bloated bureaucracy filled with these uh, middle class bureaucrats um, and the more that they run the, the more bureaucracy they have the less efficient it gets um, kind of a Kafka-esque thing right there so what's interesting is that when the revolution broke out yes the top positions of power were held by the aristocrats and I'm sure that's that's what Louis focused on, and he focused on, you know, what the Count of Orléans—it wasn't the Count, I think it was a Prince. I don't know. Again, I don't care about the elite. But <laughs> the um, essentially, Louis and his ministers were focused on the aristocrats and whether one of them was planning some sort of intrigue. What they didn't seem to realize was that because of their Bore, because of their financial policies, which nobody pays attention to because those are, they don't find as interesting as, you know, who's sleeping with who or that sort of intrigue. What they didn't realize was that basically the bourgeoisie were inhabiting all of the important mechanisms of state, at least on the lower level. And so the when the states general convened, it wasn't – the third estate essentially was already in power. I mean, they they were essentially running the entire state. The aristocrats were just the ones at the top giving orders. So it wasn't this dramatic revolution where the bourgeoisie just overthrew their aristocratic overlords. They were already effectively in, in, in uh, all of the important positions. They just decided to take over management. Right. So it's almost they wanted the political authority to match their status. If right. You know. And one thing, I, I don't think there was one part of your question which I didn't adequately answer, but um, you asked about the French government's uh, tracking of, you know, why didn't they track the, the bourgeoisie? Um, part of that is what I mentioned, which is that they underestimate their power. But another thing was that there was quite an ability of the bourgeoisie to disseminate information without being caught by the um, authorities. In particular, there was an enormous amount of smuggling of books from Switzerland. And in fact, there's quite a few uh, publishers in Switzerland who pretty much made their careers selling um, unlicensed material and selling anti-state propaganda to the French consumers. So, you know, we can blame Switzerland for the revolution, I'm sure. 
Are you saying the Swiss weren't neutral? Um, they, you know, they never really are. <laughs> so let's almost uh, zoom out again to the big picture. I, th- I, I'm going to go out on a limb and correct me here, but I'm guessing the kind of a lot of the arguments you put forward here for the causes of this revolution are what might be called structuralist. Um, in the sense that they're about the, you know, the big picture, the structure of society, the long-term changes that are happening, rendering almost the kind of decisions of individuals n- near irrelevant. Well, a yeah. d- is that kind of fair? My a fair ass- assessment of of kind of what you're putting across, and b what would be the kind of historiographical counterpoint to that? Well. I, it's interesting because even as you were asking that, I figured that now's sort of the good time to get into the historiography because we've talked a lot about the potential causes and what people have argued. But I think now I can, I think now would be a good time to just lay it out. So essentially, I think the main interpretation of the French Revolution going back to the early, well, maybe early to mid 20th century was the Marxist interpretation. And this was really championed by a uh, titan of French history at the time, uh, Georges Lefebvre, The Coming of the French Revolution, which he published in 1947. Um, Georges Lefebvre, he argued the classical Marxist interpretation, which was This was the overthrow of the old aristocracy by the bourgeoisie. Um, Not to get too much into Marxist theory, but essentially Marx theorized that society was moving. uh, First, it moved from tribalism to a medieval society. Then it moved to an industrial society, and it would eventually end with a communist society. But essentially what had to happen is the the old decrepit systems that the aristocrats had created had to be replaced by a more efficient and more dehumanizing system by the capitalists. And so Lefebvre and the Marxists argued that this was a case of these new bourgeoisie, the middle class, the capitalists overthrowing the medieval aristocratic order. So that was that was the okay. first argument. Um, the second, I think we could call revisionism, maybe even Marxist revisionism. This was really championed by uh, Francois Fioré in 1978, who the book was uh, Thoughts on the French Revolution. What was happening during the 1970s was a lot of old Marxists were becoming disillusioned with communism, particularly after the Soviet Union's brutal crackdowns. And Fure argued that the revolution was caused by um, the old the old regime discredited itself, but then there was this tendency towards totalitarianism that went through the the people in general based on Rousseau's idea of the general will, which is an interesting concept because essentially um, Lefebvre and, uh, or I shouldn't say Lefebvre, but essentially some people argued that uh, Termidor and the rise of the directory um, all these things once the where the, the revolution, revolution goes bad, kind of right. Yeah, that yeah that theory. Well, Fure says that essentially that was just a continuation of the revolution. You know, he looked at the revolution from a modern sense, and he was comparing it to the Soviet Union, and he was saying that, um, uh, you know, the Soviet Union ended up in this totalitarian state. So same thing with the French Revolution. Then that. Um, it was moving towards totalitarianism just from the start. It was trying to recreate society. So he had a a much more sort of depressing look Mm. at the uh, French Revolution. Um, So that's revisionism. Then uh, another one would be the literary review, which I covered with uh, Robert Darton, the literary underground of the 
old regime, um, 1982. And he argued that essentially, rather than the success of positive ideas like the Enlightenment, which is what some historians had argued, he was arguing that mass print slandered the Ancien Regime. And this was in contrast to intellectual historians who maybe I should have mentioned them first because I think they were before the Marxists, they were sort of the classic school and they've had, they did have a something of a revival that that whole idea has never gone away. But intellectual historians have said that there was this medieval period, there was uh, absolutist uh, monarchy, but then the enlightenment came and it showed people this better way of running society. And so the French revolution was caused by these high minded ideals of making society better. And they beat out these old bad ideas. So, and you can still find examples of that today. Um, another one was cultural interpretations, uh, Culture history, uh, which I'd recommend uh, Roger Chartier's books, uh, particularly had one in 1991, The Cultural Origins of the French Revolution. And he said that rather than an intellectual change among the elite, broad social ideas like a free press conflicted with political realities. Basically, what he was arguing was that on the one hand, people were hearing all these ideas about free society but they understood that at the time their politicians wouldn't allow that that the state was very repressive and so their idea of what a society should be conflicted with reality and so it wasn't so much um the difference between this and intellectual history is that intellectual history focuses on the decision makers whereas cultural history focuses on the people in general so that would be one argument another argument getting to uh, something that you seem to be uh, have a predilection towards is the idea of structuralism, but structuralism that incorporates international events as well. And this was argued by Bailey Stone in Rethinking the Revolution, um, 2002, where basically he argues that international and internal pressures combined to discredit the Ancien Regime. So on the one hand, there was um, a lot of internal pressures, such as uh, the bad finances and corrupt government, but there were a lot of international events as well, some of which we didn't cover and some of which are more obscure. So I, um, I'd recommend reading the book for those who are interested. But essentially... Stone argues that there was lots of events, not just the American Revolution and not just the events in the Netherlands, but at the same time, the Austrians or not Austrian, um, uh, the Russians and yeah, I, I believe the Austrians as well were essentially pushing in on French is, uh, interests with the Ottoman Empire and in the East, and there were all of these different conflicts that were constantly pulling at uh, France because France was at the time considered to be the great power of Europe, and whenever a country is a great power, they seem to think that they have to run everything. <laughs> and um I'm just thinking that, about one country today. <laughs> yeah, that, that that was not that was not a any sort of uh slight at any sort of political anyway. But in any case, yeah, so France so France was involved if, if France viewed its national interests as incorporating most of Europe and so events with with Russia becoming uh, a great power and moving in on the Ottoman Empire's territory, that upset some of what France viewed as its interests. And so all of these different things pulled at France and its inability to counter the developments uh, that were happening abroad essentially caused it to uh, discredit itself, caused it to fall apart. And um, both economically and in terms of prestige. Then there's modernization theory, which was championed by John C. Riley in his 2014 book. Um, uh, I'll, I'll get the title just one second, because it's actually a really good book. Uh, the Seven Years' War and the Old Regime in France. 
the economic and financial toll. And he essentially argues the theory that I've said that I kind of like, which is that it wasn't that France was um, this backward power. It was that France was trying to modernize, but its inability to modernize well and all of these social upheavals that were brought on by modernization really helped to bring it down. And he covers a lot of good stuff, but there's also other books which people can look up. I won't list my entire, I I won't uh, name drop my entire comps list, (laughs) but essentially there, France was moving away from guilds and moving towards corporations because they were emulating the uh, British style. But at the same time, there was all of these conflicting privileges over who could do what, because even as France was moving towards corporations, uh, the guilds were still in power. So it just created this big bureaucratic mess. And so Riley would argue that it wasn't that France was backward. It was that it was going through a modernization process, something which a lot of historians are arguing nowadays about their revolutions. Um, Some have argued that this was happening during the Russian Revolution. I think there was, uh, I think it's Kaczynski, who is a really big, he's some Harvard professor, um, uh, Oxford professor, who argued that this was what was happening for the Glorious Revolution, that it was essentially two different ideas of modernization that conflicted with each other, and that caused the Glorious Revolution. Um, I don't know. I, I don't look at Britain you know, that far back. But it's it's an interesting theory that revolution is tied to attempts at modernization. Mm-hmm. And then finally, one thing that is becoming more and more important is environmental history. And I don't have a particular book for this, but this kind of runs through a lot of modern books today that essentially this environmental disaster, the bad harvests, Uh, resulted in chaos for the state. So I think those are essentially all of our major interpretations. I don't think I'm missing anything here. And I think the truth is usually that there's a little bit of everything. But the question is, what was a bigger cause of this? And just how far back can you go? Because I think Mm -hmm. a lot of people, the idea appeals to them to look farther back sort of towards the seven years war or the war of Spanish succession. But at the same time, I don't think we can discount immediate factors. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite a quandary, but hopefully all of those different schools and my, uh, the books that I mentioned might give people something to think about for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you've painted an excellent picture there, I think, of the historiography and of the theories of, uh, you know, of this extremely complicated event and an extremely significant one in the sense that, you know, I would, I would posit that every revolution since has had some, you know, tie to the French Revolution um, in one way or another. Let's let's almost kind of flip this on its head and go the complete opposite and, and kind of put ourselves there and say, right, is there one decision or a set of decisions that Louis or anyone else could have made that could have thrown all these causal, causal factors out and averted the French Revolution? Could we have just, yeah, all those things that we've kind of gone through this whole episode of problems being stored up, of different classes, of, you know, mass disenchantment. Is there, can you see, you know, some key kind of trigger or or something that could have been done differently? 42. Um, Oh, no hitchhikers left. Oh, oh yeah, God. I know. I just got it. I just got it. There we go. <sighs> no, it's okay. it's okay. My jokes are bad. But um <laughs> I don't know. Um it's it's such a such a big question. I mean, one of the problems that 
we look at with history is the idea of mental tools. This is something that the Annalists looked at in that as society develops and as culture develops, we have all of these different ideas of, I mean, just ideas in general. I mean, if you look at, for example, uh, nowadays, we're all social distancing. I mean, I don't even think that was a concept before. I mean, obviously, no, earlier no. societies had concepts like quarantine, but until people learned about uh, the development of diseases and essentially how far a disease can spread, uh, all people knew was just to to put infected people away. They didn't realize that, oh, you can actually still run society as long as you keep a certain amount of distance away, that sort of thing. So in talking about mental tools, I mean, I, I wonder if, if the French, if these people even had the ability to realize what was going on because yeah. we – I think that, again, we need to separate the whole from the smaller parts. And in the case of Britain, Britain was doing a lot of things that were right. But did anyone actually know just how right they were going to be or how uh, how fortuitous some of their decisions would be? I mean, a Excellent lot of the time, point, actually, yeah, yeah like, like Britain – most people, if you look at their colonization efforts, most of their colonization efforts, it was because here were these desperate, starving people that figured that, well, you know, I might as well go to another continent and nothing try to, to eat. lose. Yeah, nothing to lose. But as it turned out, that was the way that the world was going. And nowadays, if you look at uh, heat maps of uh, of of trade throughout the world, it's just this unbelievable crisscrossing and so this is this is how our world runs and the british didn't know that they didn't know that this old medieval society where people just basically produce uh everything they need to to survive they didn't know that that was the past and now the future is you know everybody gets all of their personal products from somewhere a thousand miles mm -hmm. away so in the case of of france i mean you know, I uh, theoretically, I suppose, you know, if I went back in time and made myself king, I mean, I suppose <laughs> that I could fix everything. But even even a, an absolutely brilliant person who was put in a position of power, who only had the information that they had at the time, I'm not sure that they could. Um, as far as as uh, so, your question being what what they could have done to avert the revolution. I mean, I think. Again, and another problem is if you look at the all the wars that were being fought, I mean, on the one hand, yes, fighting all those wars was a bad decision. But on the other hand, if they didn't fight the wars, then that would embolden their enemies. They would be looked at as weak, and then their enemies would be able to ally against them and fight more wars. Uh, so one of the funny causes... Uh, Funny things is the whole issue of what was happening in the Netherlands where France didn't act. And so here was something that they were staying out of because they wanted to actually save up money. And yet that discredited their regime. And so their attempts to be fiscally responsible was actually probably a, a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't think that fighting a war would be a good thing, but I mean, either way, it was a damned if you do, damned if yeah. you don't. I mean, so so honestly, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that, you know, not to – history is never inevitable, but there are certain things that are very probable. And I think if you look at the development of the French state from Louis XIV uh, onward, essentially Louis did what a lot of great leaders do, whether it's Charlemagne or, you know, Napoleon or what have you, which is – he created this brilliant uh, system, but it was entirely dependent on him, and it was dependent on winning continual military victories, none of which you can do forever. Yeah. So I think that something was going to happen. The question is how radical it was going to be, and I think that if Louis the Sixteenth was more competent, then when the Estates General convened, uh, 
yeah, it's possible he may have been able to get something like a constitutional monarchy, kind of like mm -hmm. what the British have, um, but probably he would be more powerful. So I think at that point, sure, I'm, I'm sure that that would be feasible. But I think the there was no single set of of uh, ideas or no set of uh, decisions that could have changed a lot of these big precursors because a lot of the problems, you know, um, in terms of British modernization, uh, and again, I say British, but we have to keep in mind that for the, the first industrial revolution, it was mostly just the English. Um, the England, very small country, it was, had a lot of water, had a lot of uh, waterways, which meant a lot of water wheels, which we can't, underestimate just how important that was um a lot of easy access to coal uh it was you know they were in a prime position to modernize and whereas france france is this relatively speaking france is this huge country with a largely rural population very rich soil um which favors peasants as opposed to britain where it's um essentially their geography made them it gave them a predilection towards mercantilism and so um through no genius of their own they essentially through happenstance of geography and these long social these uh long standing historical trends were in a prime position to dominate the world Whereas with France, they, you know, their social circumstances, they made them powerful in the short term because they had this large population that they could draw on, but, and they, and they did have uh, quite a lot of, of food, um, which was great at the time. But at the same time, the things that made them great during this period would set them up for problems later on. So I, I think that individual decisions or actions could have possibly resulted in a constitutional monarchy or some sort of shared power but i do think that they were headed for some sort of chaos regardless and whether they decided to st stay out of one war or engage in another war i i i don't think it would have mattered you know that's one of the points you made i feel like is possibly the best point that's ever been made on history's most which is so crucial to the to, to history and the study of history and the which is the idea that you know as historians we inevitably work backwards you know we know what's going to happen and so we we work backwards and work out okay why did that happen uh what can i add together to mean you know this all added up to the french revolution or britain becoming you know a world power and we kind of miss the fact that you know people were living it forwards in the mm. sense that they didn't really know what was around the corner any more than we do um you know they didn't know the consequences or at least all the consequences of a lot of the decisions they took in their daily lives just as you know often we don't um and just to interject a small thing is that i i think that that's something that historians and those of us who are interested in history should keep in mind because historians are very often very bad prophets because we are looking towards the past, which can be illuminating. And I think that people definitely should do that a lot more because you can learn a lot from that. Mm -hmm. But again, here were people in the case of, of Britain going through this mercantile revolution. Here were people who were living out and doing things inadvertently, which they had no idea that they were part of this great industrial capitalist yeah. revolution. And so we can look to the past for possible solutions, but sometimes, you know, we might be going through a process that we don't even know what's happening. And later yeah. historians will have to figure out for us because we literally don't have the mental tools for this. Yeah, I mean, if you ask someone living in the Industrial Revolution, what do you think of the Industrial Revolution? I'm not sure many of them would know what you were talking yeah. about. Right. Um, let's kind of um, draw this all together a little bit then. The French Revolution clearly was an extremely 
you know, complex event with myriad causes, long and short term. Can you paint us then a picture, Gary, almost going back to how we started the episode of if someone asked you, <laughs> if someone asked you what caused the French Revolution and uh, they were, I don't know, catching a train. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Can you, this is almost a challenge to you, can you say, you know what, this is what caused it? Well, I I hope their train gets delayed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I think what I would say was... We're desperately trying to climb out the rabbit hole now and see right, yeah. the picture. I mean... <laughs> see what I mean. I'll, yeah, no, I understand. And I think I, I can sum it up very simply in a way that loses all the minutia in that all societies will undergo a certain amount of upheaval because every society essentially does things that work until it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. I mean, look at Britain. I mean, Britain, as we mentioned, had a very tumultuous 17th century and yet they came out of it uh, far better for it because their their old systems failed and they adopted new ones. Same thing in the case of the French Revolution. They had this old system that worked fantastically under Louis XIV. France became the dominant power of Europe, taking over from the declining Spanish Empire. So they had this fantastic system, but then it met with changes, or it met with uh, challenges, and then it fell apart. And so why did the French Revolution occur? It occurs because this happens to all societies. Why was it such a complete revolution? Why did it affect so much of society? Why was it so much more widespread than the English Civil War or the American Revolution? I think because France was really the first, the French Revolution was arguably the first modern revolution because here it wasn't just the removal from political power of one group of powerful by another. This was a whole new economic class, a whole group of people that had a different view on the world. Their education was different. And so they wanted to remake the country in their image so I think that's why it was a more complete revolution because it happened at this particular point in time where there was financial change, there was technological change, the infrastructure was good enough that you could create a nation. I mean, argue, a lot of historians say that the French Revolution created the first nation, nation state. state yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, so all of these things really came together. And I think that's why it was so much more complete. So I think in a very, very short way, I would say that to the person as they get on the train. <laughs> and I think they've just made it. Yes, I can see they, they've gone on. Yes. Fantastic. Well, I, I think you've made some really um, you know, fascinating points that have made me think more deeply about history than I do, despite it being my my day job um than i do often um particularly the whole kind of things happening backwards and forwards and i i i like your phrase about systems work until they don't i think you know that really applies to a lot of situations and helps us understand so often in history as historians because we're working backwards we think why didn't someone stop this why couldn't they see it coming you know i think about let's say the rise of the nazis for example um, and actually Germany, it's 20th century history, I think is a good example of things work till they don't, then it goes very yeah. wrong. And then actually they build better systems out of it, perhaps. Um, when you look at 21st century Germany, maybe, and who knows, maybe, um, what's happening right now around the world, RE, um, COVID could be some sort of systems work until they don't, mm. but, um, like, like yeah. you kind of said, we don't know think, until people later can look back for us. Right, absolutely. And I think Germany is a great example because, yeah, they, they uh, went very, very badly. 
But now look at them. They're the most respected country in the world. Angela Merkel is considered to be the leader of the free world by a lot of people. Not only that, but in the case of COVID-19, Germany has, I think, the lowest per capita deaths of any yeah, country in, incredibly in, well. in Europe. Yeah. So, I mean, Germany, yeah, things just like England transitioning from 17th to 18th and all these countries that had revolutions. Yeah. Germany, they went very bad, but because of that, they got to start over and, and wow, they've done a, a really great job. Let's um, finish with what we is, is going to become a regular feature when we get more of these, more and more of these interviews um, done, which is our quick fire questions. And we're looking for, this is a challenge um, that, uh, you know, to everyone who comes on is your, your gut instinct first answer. So here goes, um, Gary, history's best general. Napoleon, but I'm biased. That's the second time. Our first, our first yeah. interview, Napoleon as well. Jacob said yeah. Napoleon, history of um, a ger- podcast on Germany. He said one of his greatest achievements as well was dismantling the Holy Roman Empire, <laughs> which we all got behind us being, yes, a very good thing to do. Well, he's biased um, too because, you know, he's eventually going to have to cover that. Oh, and that's like a yeah, thousand yeah. different we, we, we had a little discussion especially about that <laughs> yeah. the episode. The, the most unenviable task any podcast, I think, could ever have. Um, right. History's worst government or leader, Gary? Oh, my gosh. So many to choose from. I know. Um, And I don't want to choose anything contemporary and uh, get people angry. Um, Wow. I don't even... Hang on, because I want to offer something good. Um, We We can edit here if you want. No, that that's fine. I'm I'm trying to think. Uh, wow, because because there's so many ways that you could take that question. Because on the one hand, there's uh, I'll just say Hitler. <laughs> two, out, two, two for two. Jacob said yeah, <laughs> he said the Nazis as well. I mean, yeah. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, it makes sense. It's a good, it's answer, a good, it's it's good answer. <laughs> Another thing, if I could take it in a in a slightly different way, because you said yeah. world's worst, again, depending on how you interpret that, um, you could say Genghis Khan, not because he was it was bad no, at his job, because yeah, yeah. I mean, he was actually quite good. In fact, uh, the Mongols ended up killing, I think, like something like eleven uh, percent of the world's mm-hmm. population through their just constant carnage. So, I mean, it, it, he was. It's amazing because that one. He he killed so many people that he actually slightly lowered the temperature of the planet. I don't know if you guys had heard that, but there's actually been scientific yeah, studies. Awesome. Yeah, that it, it wasn't by much. It was by 0.1 degrees Celsius. But even still, he killed so many people that forests regrew and the planet actually cooled. You know, he was he was the Thanos of <laughs> the day. <laughs> Good way of putting it. Fantastic. Um Let's see. Um, one of the ones we did with with Jacob was most complicated event you've come across in history, but I think we maybe have covered that in this episode. <laughs> maybe. So, um, let's go with um, something that was our very, very first topic. It'll be interesting to hear what you have to say for this one, which is history's most guilty man, or, or indeed woman. Um, well, I already used up Hitler. So. Yeah, you've used up Hitler, so... I don't know. I think, you know, Himmler is a very interesting figure because he, uh, you know, I, I always look at him as sort of the true final boss villain <laughs> because he always seemed more evil to me than than Hitler. But I don't know. I mean, most guilty. It's it's that's a very interesting question because uh, I mean, you know, I if you look at the most complete genocide in history, we're looking at, you'd have to look at the, the killing of uh, native Americans mm-hmm. because something like, I think 90% of all native Americans were killed in the Columbian exchange. I mean, that's an unbelievable number of a population mm-hmm. that was, I think 
maybe around a hundred million across both continents. And that that's just unbelievable. But the thing is, is like, who's responsible because most of that was germs, but then of course you have the conquistadors and then you have the, uh, European colonizers of North America. So, I mean, who's guilty? I mean, you can't put it on th- a person. That yeah. that's a question that we're still debating, particularly as it concerns like reparations and that sort of mm-hmm. thing. But you know, that's pretty that's pretty mind blowing. All right, I'll take your answer to be Christopher Columbus then. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Who that guy? Um, we went actually Eric Ludendorff um, and listeners who haven't listened to our first episode can find out why but it was linked to the to the uh to the nazis to some extent um well that's cheating <laughs> just saying the nazis again godwin's yeah. law um well thank you so much um for joining us gary uh, you've really um i would say certainly this has been a really stimulating episode in terms of making me think about history not just of the french revolution but it almost the big picture and the almost the matter of how we do history yeah um, and it's educated me and i'm hoping that you know i can i can take away some advice from this as as to as i expand my kind of interest into history i i can kind of think about it the right way you know yeah, I mean, that's something we're still all trying to get. Yeah. So, you know, hopefully uh, this has been more illuminating than obfuscating for people. Mm. I'm sure it has. And at the very least, entertaining either way. Yeah. Yes. Inform, educate, entertain. Um, that's all we've got time for then on History's Most this week. Thank you well, once again. Gary, and listen to the French History Podcast, please. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's uh, been fun. Thanks for coming on. Uh, we've we've really enjoyed it. And, um, well, I have been uh, Peter. And I've been Alex. And thank you for listening to History's Most. Mm-hmm.